right, everybody, welcome up. Today is June 13th. Good morning. Welcome to Simply Cyber's Daily Cyber Threat Briefing, episode 130, coming from the off-site location. I'm your host, Gerald Lozier, and over the next 30 minutes, I'll be delivering the top cybersecurity news of the day and providing expert analysis on each of these stories, on what it means to you as a practitioner, or if you're looking to break into the industry, you're definitely going to be asked about what's going on, and you'll be able to answer that question like a boss. Shout out and thanks to this stream's sponsor, Barricade Cyber Solutions. Cyber criminals have stolen your company's data and derailed your business operations. Barricade Cyber Solutions. Oh no. Okay, hold on. Let me go through the intro and then I'll see if maybe um, I'm using the wrong mic here. Okay, guys. <laughs> this is how it works. Okay, so maybe I'm not even talking into this thing. Hold on a second. Let me do this. Let me do this. Give me a second. You guys are the best. Uh, you know what I'm going to do? Hello? Okay, so that's definitely going to be my microphone. But in order to splice in the podcast... Um, so this this should be my microphone. So mods, if you can help me. I'm holding it up to my grill too, so... Um, hopefully that sounds better. Okay. <laughs> Let me know in chat. All right, cool. So, what were we talking about? Oh, shout out and thanks to this stream sponsor, Barricade Cyber Solutions. Cyber criminals have stolen your company's data and derailed your business operations. Barricade Cyber Solutions will help you resolve this ransomware attack and get your business back on track. Definitely think about calling Eric Taylor and the Barricade Cyber Solutions team just to get prepped for a ransomware incident. If you don't have, um, at least thought through what a ransomware would look like um, in execution at your business. This is what Barricade Cyber Solutions does. So when it actually happens, they can help you too. But like, you really should be thinking about these things. Also, um, Eric Taylor's in mod chat helping me out with the audio. So that's good. I want to remind you, if you hold professional certifications that require CPEs, each episode of the Daily Cyber Threat Brief is worth half a CPE. So it's two and a half a week, 10 a month. Be sure to document literally the easiest and I would consider the most enjoyable way to earn CPs. How do you do that? Just say what's up in chat. If your username is Kimberly can fix it, maybe you change it and say, what's up, Kimberly McKnight up in chat. That way you can point to it. But if your name is Mark Scott, you know, I think that points to itself, right? Good morning, everybody. If you're live, love it. Thanks for being here. I see 62 of you dump, jumping in here. Goes to show you that it's all about the content, not about the audio or video uh quality uh if you're on replay thanks for catching the stream you lucky ducks hey i don't have access to my countdown timers and my overlays it, where i'm currently operating from so just trust me we'll talk for a minute or two and then when you see the CISO series stuff uh jump on that's when we're going to start the stories but you know we've done this enough times we this is this is our routine people so for the next i don't know say two minutes let's just catch up and chat i'll explain what's going on here and uh, i'll have to be messing with my um with my audio to get it to work um, for for everything, okay? Oh, what's up? Thank you very much for the super chat. Cybersec mom, bringing it. Love it, thank you so much. All right, let me see what's going on, guys. I wanna tell you, oh, no problem. Thanks, uh, Josh, thanks, Eric. Let me ask you this. So the mic is now on the desk and pointed up. That way I can access my coffee. Is this audio still sound good? Hmm. Hopefully it sounds good. Guys, we will be um, raffling off a pound of coffee every single day this week. Okay. Compliments of whole human cyber initiative. So um, super pumped about that. We're going to be doing the news stories just the same. Okay. Well, you know what? I can hold this mic up in my grill. You know what I'm going to do? I'm going to hold it up in my grill. I'm going to, I'm going to be reporting live from the scene like a boss. Okay. And after this first go round of uh, getting all this sorted out, uh, I'll, I'll add process improvements. I tried to add a little background lighting, guys. What's up? All right, um, let me see. So the audio is really gonna be a tricky one today until I get this figured out. Oh, that's a bit much, you guys. What if I talk like this? Uh, you guys don't know the struggle when it comes to content streaming with audio. 
All right, so I've been told not to eat the mic like a Twinkie. So if that's what I'm doing, uh, my bad. <laughs> All right, real quick, I do want to share with you guys. Um, if you haven't done it yet, go check out Gerald Osier Simply Cyber on Instagram. Um, I don't know if you can really see this, but basically I'm posting at least once a day, maybe a couple times a day. And it's exactly what you would think. It's cybersecurity content, behind the scenes stuff. Uh, reaction, you know, just this kind of vibe that you get on Instagram. So if you're not subbed over there, consider jumping on there and getting on board. You can see I've got the content, some some um, excerpts from videos I've done, a couple, you know, celebration things like sub count, some quotes from uh, different talks I've given. So it's all about good times, right? All right, let me go back to chat and see how everybody's doing. Okay, cool. So guys, here's the deal. Um, I am operating from my uh, in-laws for the next five weeks. Uh, I drove 16 hours on Saturday uh, and we got here Saturday night and we kind of decompressed and settled in on Sunday. I set up the studio and uh, yeah, we're ready to rock. I, I very much appreciate the opportunity to continue to do this while I uh, am visiting family. There's a dog one. You guys always hear the dogs in the in the background. There's dog number one. That is Ripley. All right. All right. So now comes the uh, <laughs> the next challenge. Let me know if you can hear the podcast. Okay. Let me um, change my audio. Guys. We're going to see, oh wait, hold on. Let me say hi to people in chat. I didn't even do that. I'm sorry. Jim Wales, what's up? Good to see you. Thanks for joining the squad. I saw you um, come in on squad. I loved it. Thank you. Um, shout out to Bill Green, Kenton O'Brien, Doris Shot Noose, Jessica Propes, Glenn Stevenson, Jason Skates, S. Lindsay, William Helsell, Chris Sharp, George Strasberger, who also uh, bought the GRC course and paid it forward. Thanks, George. Jeremy Sharp, Stiber Norse, and um Imtiaz Khan you guys are wonderful thank you so much for squad support um I, I I really appreciate it it helps support the channel it helps let me know that you enjoy what what we're doing on the channel and I'll keep doing more of it so thank you um Michael Huskin thank you Michelle Rose good to see you good morning Dan Catledge Nathan Bolin good morning guys where are you coming in from let me know uh, maybe we can get an international uh, minus Antarctica tick tonight, right? Kristen W. Good to see you, Chris Weaver. See you full name, Kristen. Morning from Tampa Bay. Good luck to the Rays. I'm pulling for Colorado, but Midori, we can agree to disagree, right? All right, guys, let's get into the um, the podcast, all right? Let's, let's get our cyber threat brief. I'm going to change my audio, so you guys should be able to hear the podcast. Let's go. Okay, mods, get ready. I need to know if you can hear it. Here we go. From the CISO series, it's cybersecurity headlines. It's Monday, June 13th, 2022. Amazon's chat app has a child sex abuse problem. Amazon's encrypted messaging app, WickerMe, has become a go-to destination for people exchanging child sexual abuse materials. NBC found dozens of forums containing hundreds of posts soliciting minors or child sex abuse content alongside Wicker screen names. Unfortunately, Amazon is doing little compared to other platforms to address the problem. In 2021, Facebook made over 22 million reports, while Instagram and WhatsApp combined to report nearly 5 million more instances of potential child sexual exploitation activity. Wicker only self-reported a meager 15 instances of child sex abuse materials over the same period. Though third-party reports related to Wicker totaled 3,500 last year, officials are calling on the platform to take more proactive measures to address the issue. Hmm. Okay. Just have to excuse me because in between stories, I'm going to have to um, 
change the audio outputs to my mic. Yeah, I I don't have access to all my my gear, Josh. I appreciate it. Um, okay, guys. So here's the deal. Um, this Wicker thing, I didn't even hear of Wicker until just now. I didn't realize Amazon had a messaging app. Um, I feel like two things here. One, unfortunately, uh, people with who are into like kids and whatever that is, it's just deplorable and it's obviously socially unacceptable, but there are people who have that kind of like mental affliction, if you will. And I honestly feel like they are going to find tools and utilities and mechanisms in order to uh, be predatory on children. Right. So obviously you need a comprehensive approach to addressing this particular um, issue. Uh, but like I said, you know, it's going to, if it's not wicker, it's going to be the next thing, whatever. Um, I am a little disappointed, honestly, considering that Amazon is the second largest company, right? I believe it's either number one or number two, as far as like revenue and capital and all that stuff goes. They have infinite money, essentially, to be able to address this. So it makes me think that they basically stood up this wicker app because they either got it through some acquisition and they were like, oh, everybody else is doing a messaging app. We should do one too. And then like, they just kind of like threw it out there without any real long-term play or long-term strategy for support. And this is what happens when you roll something out that isn't really ready for prime time or doesn't have support, which, okay. So now I'm thinking this is a direct correlation to information security. Okay. So let's bring this full circle to, or bring this to actually what matters to us. If you are a practitioner, you know this full well. If you're looking to get in the industry, this is a pro tip, okay? You see this all the time where people are like, oh, let's prototype something. Let's let's beta test it. Let's We've got a great idea, but like this R&D team, let's try it out. And they roll it out and it works well. And instead of pulling the, 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 the prototype down and being like, okay, these are the things that work. These are the things that did not work. Let's make a like a pro tool. Let's Let's do it right. They're like the business starts using the prototype and then it becomes a mission critical app, right? In the extreme cases. And then that's it. You can't pull it out of production anymore because it is part of production. It's like people are depending on it. Systems are depending on it. This happens all the time. It's gross, honestly. Um, and the problem is it's really difficult to make the argument that like we need to pull it down. It wasn't built for production because the business just sees it as something that's adding business value and to pull it out. You better have a really good explanation that you can convince them with on why you can't um, and why you can't use it right now, right? So this happens all the time. I don't know if anybody's ever seen this, but it happens all the time. You know, another another just this is a quick hit. Another thing that happens is like let's say Jim Wales. I see you, Jim, in chat. Jim Wales develops like a really sick, awesome. A prototype of like an access database that does something right, or like some chat app that leverages a couple like open source tools, and he demonstrates that like, oh, this chat app would be cheap to run, and everybody would love it. And then, it, like, it becomes part of production. And now it it gets dumped on Jim. Is like, well, Jim, you're gonna have to maintain it. And Jim's like, fine, this sucks, but fine. And then Jim gets a better job and leaves, and then nobody knows how to maintain it. But it's mission critical, so then it just kind of hangs out. And nobody wants to patch the server underneath because they don't want to break it. And it's logged in with Jim's credentials. So let's not disable Jim's account. Like that happens all the time. That's It's it's gross legacy shadow uh, IT type stuff. It happens all the time. Okay, let me, <laughs> let me change my audio again. Ransomware decryptors now for sale on gaming platform. Last Thursday, researchers identified threat actors selling a decryptor for new ransomware on the Roblox gaming platform using the services in-game currency called Robux. The ransomware, referred to as Wanna Friend Me, impersonates the notorious Ryuk ransomware, but is actually a variant of a strain called Chaos, which is a do-it-yourself ransomware builder for wannabe criminals. The decryptor is being sold for around 1,500 Robux by a user named iRazorMind, but only smaller files can be decrypted because WannaFriendMe deletes files larger than 2 megabytes. China's biggest... Okay, 
this is a hot mess. This whole this whole thing. Okay. Good thing. Sorry, guys. All right. Yeah, I know. I know I shouldn't have to switch things. I, I couldn't test it this weekend, though, because I didn't have I, whatever. Um, okay, guys. So here's the deal. Um, this Robux thing, I don't know if you guys know this, but this isn't surprise me, okay? There is all these, all these like pay to play games are like Fortnite V Bucks and uh, Roblox Robux and um, Minecraft coins, right? It's it's an in-game currency. They're making a ton of money and good on them for doing it. But it sounds now like this is like <laughs> this is like amateur hour um, as far as kiddos um, learning how to commit cybercrime. So listen, listen to this, guys. Okay, check this out. This is killing me. There are all these initiatives, right? On like, oh, like learn how to code. Like here's a Legos set and you have to code underneath it. Or like we've seen or at least I've seen, because I have young children, Minecraft apps that like you can build a Minecraft world, but then there's like kind of like, um, like not WYSIWYG programming, but like you take chunks of code and you, you drop them in and they kind of fit together like puzzle pieces. So they'll have like conditional loops are yellow and variables are pink and functions are green, right? So you can kind of see them and, and you stack them together. And you can build some basic functionality. And the concept is like STEM learning, right? We're going to teach our kids um, coding without all of the minutia of um, deck, you know, variable declaration and memory allocation, all this crap. We're just going to get it to them easy and then show them the output immediately with something that they know so they can be into it. This right here is basically very similar, except it's it's like... If you if your dad's a cyber criminal and he's like, you know, son, I really want to get you in the family business. Let let's do like a um an easy ransomware, like a, a what do you code drop drag and drop code, like drag and drop ransomware. So that's what this sounds like, and it sounds like you're targeting um Roblox players. And by the way, like it, I guess the 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 two things here that I'll point out one. Threat actors are going to go where the money is, right? These platforms, these 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 ransomware, I mean, the, these Roblox platforms, these V-Bucks platforms, they are making massive amounts of money. So as long as there are tons of money there, people are going to go there, right? Secondly, um, kids, kids don't know any better. So they are a perfect target, if you will, to attack because... They just don't know any better. So educate your children. If if they do play Roblox, Fortnite, all these things, especially Roblox, um, educate them on these type of things. Like my my one son is huge on Roblox and he wants me to do all this stuff. And I'm like, I'm, I'm like, no, like that is, that's a straight scam, dude. Like explain to me why someone would give you a bunch of money for nothing. Explain that to me. He's like, because they said they would. I'm like, what are we doing here, bro? Okay, let's go into the next story. As I as I uh, mangle this podcast, let's keep going. Online influencers go dark. On June third, a thirty year old live streamer named Austin Lee, who has over sixty million followers on the Alibaba owned e commerce platform Taobao, abruptly cut off a live stream just after posting an image of a military tank shaped dessert, which has been linked to the anniversary of the June fourth Tiananmen Square protests and massacre. While the account posted that the stream experienced technical dis, government censorship is thought to have been the true cause. Lee isn't known to have been arrested, active, but he hasn't streamed or posted on social media since that day. Toward the end of 2021, Taubo's first and third most followed live streaming influencers had their live stream accounts deleted after being fined millions of dollars by local authorities for tax evasion. In China, live streaming e-commerce is a massive industry worth over $180 billion. All right. Okay, like here's my shocked face. <laughs> what what do you think was going to happen? 
like guys, we have seen it time and time again. There's like the only real information security story here is that this, um, the Chinese country rules as an authoritative, I guess, like, I, don't blow me up in chat if this is the wrong word, but correct, you know, let me know if this is not 100% accurate, but the government rules in a very authoritative manner. And we have seen this time and time again, there was a major tennis star, like, like Serena Williams ish, right? Like that level of celebrity in China. And she had said something or she had been like sexually assaulted by a senior military official and told people. And then she disappeared for like a week. And then she came back and apologized and said that she was wrong. Right. This dude, 60 million subs live streaming all the time, not having to switch between uh, mic inputs. Right. He's got a smooth operation and he, he does something with Tiananmen Square. Of course, he's going to disappear. Now, what I do find interesting is that his stream got pulled down uh, mid stream. So he he's obviously large enough that they actually had people um, who were responsible for watching his stream and making sure that his stream did not uh, conflict with whatever the national message was. Right. Um, because, again, guys, think about this for a second. The whole, the whole idea, this is a macro level picture, okay, of our society. So, you know, don't, I'm not going crazy here, right? The main idea here is that we, as, as people like, like become content creators and begin to have a platform to speak. This dude had 60 million people who, you know, I'm sure he didn't get 60 million in stream all the time, but his message, his voice is unfiltered and it's his own and he has influence, right? That's called, why they're called influencers, right? So traditionally it was the government pushing messages down and then like a couple major media outlets, which would ingest the message and communicate to the masses, right? And people could have their own thoughts and opinions, but you couldn't reach a large audience effectively in order to influence or change the, the tide on some issue, right? Well, now with access to the internet and, and the streaming platforms, there's been a decentralization on whose voice gets heard and how that message goes out. And it's very difficult for these authoritative regimes to control that message, right? Like what is the message? What is the spin? What is the propaganda that we want to highlight or focus on? That has been eroded because of stuff like this. So um, my guess, my estimate, if I had to agree, or if I had to agree, I read the word agree in chat, sorry. If I had to speculate what will happen is this individual will resurface by the end of the week and he will have a completely different opinion of what he did and of, of like the whole thing, right? He'll probably also look a little different, right? Maybe a little, little lighter, a little more tired. So again, that's not really an info sex story. That's more of a neuro societal story. Apple dives deeper into finance with new offering. After launching Apple Pay and a credit card in partnership with Goldman Sachs, Apple plans to offer a buy now, pay later offering in the U.S. later this year. Consumers shopping with Apple Pay will be able to split purchases into four payments due every two weeks without incurring interest or late charges. Apple will use credit reports and FICO scores to make lending decisions and will limit transactions to a maximum of $1,000 each. Apple also plans to leverage its giant store of Apple ID data for identity verification and fraud prevention. And okay. All right, here's the deal. This isn't a major news story other than Apple is trying to squeeze every single penny out of all the customers all the time. We've seen this a couple times now where like for for minor not minor purchases, but like microtransactions, right? Most people take loans out for a vehicle or a home or a business, right? Large kind of investments. Now, a lot of businesses now are doing this thing where like, oh, hey, like you want to buy like an $800 phone and you can't afford it right now? Here, you can, uh, you can buy now, pay later, right? And obviously the idea here is twofold. One is a legit reason and the other one I'm a bit cynical on, okay? The legit reason, you want it now and you can afford $200 a week for a month 
and they want they want it in your hand because as soon as you get it in your hand, you start using it, you become not vendor lock in, but committed to using that particular solution. And you know, you're good to go. The other more cynical reason is because uh oh, you can't hear me. Can you guys hear me? I'm getting message that my audio is out. I'm getting message that my audio is out. Please. Okay, cool. Hold on. Does we can mean you can hear me? Okay, cool. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. I appreciate it. Okay. We're all going through this together. Okay. The first <laughs> maiden voyage on the new studio. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So here's the deal. The cynical side of me also says like, oh yeah, no problem. Like even if you can only afford 200 bucks, um, why is this not allowing me to switch? If you can only afford 200 bucks, then we'll take your 200 bucks. Right. And then we'll like repo your phone I, or repo your MacBook or whatever it is. I, I don't know, but um, I always feel a little cynical on this about them squeezing everything. You, like, I don't know, chat, what, like I'll go back and read chat. Let me know what you guys think. Like part of me is like, this is a complete, you know, capitalistic nightmare where they're trying to squeeze everything out of people where it's like, oh, I can't afford, I can't afford this. Hey, no problem. What can you afford? We'll take it. And then, you know, it, but at the same time, someone put in chat here, financial groceries, right? Like, I mean, if you can't afford it today, but just just think about like predatory loan practices, right? Like payday loans, title loans, like it's the same thing, right? You don't have money today. Well, here, here's a bunch of money. But then like we're going to be predatory on you. So I'm sure Apple's not doing that exactly since they have infinite money and it's more about getting the adoption higher. But um, I would I would make I would suspect that a lot of people are going to be um, a lot of businesses will be doing this, right? We've already seen it with Amazon. I've seen Amazon offer like payment plans. My Chase credit card offers payment plans. Um, Capital One offers payment plans, like all these different ones. So, you know, it is what it is. Okay, guys, let's take a minute here and actually do the coffee raffle. Okay. So this is from the whole cyber human initiative, Paul Cummings. You can see Simply Cyber is a partner, which is awesome. They are all about helping people take advantage of free cybersecurity resources. Part of the problem with cybersecurity is that there's so much to do. Like there's so many options, so many ways you can go that people who are new to the industry get overwhelmed and not sure what to do. And then they end up spending seven grand on a boot camp, and then it doesn't really get them value. And then they're really upset. Right. Like we just, I just talked to someone recently. I don't know if she's in chat right now, but I actually did a little evaluation and helped somebody um, come to the conclusion that the, the, the boot camp they were in was um, a total, um, no, it wasn't the value. And they, they were able to get all their money back and they're already doing amazing things in a different way that costs nothing. So, whole, whole Cyber Human Initiative is doing that. They are going to be raffling off coffee one pound a week. So guys, I mean, one pound a day all week this week. So the, the code word is spicy. So put spicy, S-P-I-C-Y in chat if you want to enter. And uh, at the end of the episode, I will roll um, for the for the coffee and we will, you know, hopefully win, win on that. Okay. No, Shane, Shane Prevost, it's S-P-I-C-Y, S-P-I-C-Y. Oh, okay. I don't know why. Why can't I show that, Josh? I don't know why I can't show the CloudBot page, but it must be an OPSEC thing. Anyways, yeah, I see you guys all. Let's keep the stories going, and then we'll do the raffle afterwards, okay? And now, a word from our sponsor, Datadog operates services in an increasingly competitive and treacherous digital economy. Watch now at datadoghq.com/cso. Wow. Hackers leverage Confluence bug to mine crypto. According to Checkpoint Research, a hacking group called the 8220 Gang is now exploiting the recently identified remote code execution flaw in Atlassian Confluence, tracked as CVE 2022-26134. 
The hackers first scan for vulnerable Windows and Linux endpoints, then send specifically crafted HTTP requests to exploit the bug and drop a payload to set up its crypto miners. Atlassian issued a fix back on June 3rd and, not shockingly, urges customers to patch the vulnerability as soon as possible. Pipe? All right. So, I mean, oh God, this is so annoying having to change the audio back. Okay, so this is not um, new. We actually talked about this on stream last week, the Atlassian bug. Remember, if you have Atlassian and you're using Confluence in your environment, you absolutely should have addressed this. This is a very straightforward, easy to exploit remote code, um, non-authentication, remote code execution, non-code, uh, or non remote code execution, non-authentication, meaning anyone on the internet can send a specially crafted HTTP request to a Confluence server and exploit it. And basically now they're seeing this 8220 gang running crypto miners on it. Now you can see this is basically the malicious HTTP request, very simple. Um, my, I didn't hear the whole story, but my expectation is that um, this will run some type of, um, obviously this will run on the Confluence server, but this will really just reach out to the C2 server and pull down the actual payloads, I would assume, or it'll reach out and allow them to, um, yeah, here, it says right here, the payload fetches an executable malware dropper and then spawns a child process spawner on Windows, right? So once they get in there, then they establish persistence. And then once they have persistence, they can log directly into the machine and do whatever they want, right? So, which is, they're installing crypto miners. Again, no surprise um, on that because that is, it, it, guys, if you don't know this, like in the grand scheme of things, like ransomware pays a lot, but it's like you get one shot. And, you know, even recently, some, organizations are just like, we're not going to pay, period. With with the crypto miner, it can run quietly in the background. No one will notice it. If you do notice it, some information security practitioners don't actually, um, uh, will we'll we'll prioritize it to, to remedy it. So, you know, whatever. This isn't surprising. Long story short, if you have Atlassian Confluence patch it, um, this might be a good story just to kind of, if, if someone says like, oh, tell me a recent uh, incident and like maybe what 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 happened and what would patch it or how would you have uh, prevented it? Um, this is a good one. It's very basic. It's very simple. Um, again, it's a remote code ex um, execution, non-authentication bug that's easily exploited with a simple HTTP um, packet. I don't know what Eddie did, but it seems like people are excited about it. So congratulations. I'm happy for you too. I'll go back and see it in chat. API packages mistakenly include malware. Certain versions of several API packages, including Keep, which gets downloaded an average of over 8,000 times per week, were found to contain a backdoor due to the presence of a malicious REST dependency. Keep project version 1.2 contains the request command, but spelled without the S, which directs the project to a password stealer. At this time, it's not clear whether this was due to a typo, self-sabotage, or by maintainer accounts getting hijacked. However, CVEs have now been assigned to vulnerable project versions. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Okay. So this is not a surprise, guys, okay? This is... PyPy is a very popular... Uh, Python package. Okay. Like very popular. Um, somebody basically went into one of the dependencies. So not PyPy itself, but a dependency of PyPy um, or an imported module. Looks like it's called the keep module in the setup.py Python program, went right into GitHub and um, put a malicious, some malicious stuff in here, basically a password stealer. Pretty smart. Um, the key takeaway here is I'm glad that they caught it. What you need to know is there is a, a, a major initiative going on right now of people trying to um, make open source software more secure because crap like this happens. Open source means that anyone can commit to it. Some of the bigger projects, they will have um, kind of dedicated developers who are doing it voluntarily. We just saw recently that Amazon, Microsoft, Google, 
Um, they were investing a, a large amount of money. We covered it in, in the Daily Cyber Threat Brief a couple of weeks ago. They're investing a significant amount of money to put together kind of a task force that's responsible for monitoring more popular, more highly adopted open source projects and doing security code reviews and managing them in a more, I guess, secure minded fashion, which is fantastic because crap like this happens, right? Here, here's the thing too, right? You could have this PyPy Pi thing. It's not like you don't launch PyPy, right? You launch an app that uses PyPy, Pi, that uses Keep, right? So you you could have this password stealer in your environment and not even know it because of like the 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 quote unquote supply chain of open source software, right? People bake in things and then those things get baked into other things. Um, we saw this famously in December of 2021 when Log4j exploded and people were like, ah. Oh, we don't even know where it is. People ended up having to like actively attempt to exploit their own systems just to verify whether or not their softwares were uh, susceptible to exploitation. So be mindful of this. I guess the key takeaway for me is I guess you'd have to look to see if you can tell if you're using this version of PyPy that calls this um, compromised dependency module or Go to um, go to this story here. I'll put the story in chat unless it's already in chat. This might be a good one just in general to familiarize yourself with, but there might be some guidance here on how to verify what. Oh, I are you kidding me? Okay, I can't even post the chat because now I'm getting challenged for authentication. Whatever. Okay, so that's that's the takeaway here. Okay. and a uh, real estate app. New Chrome extension helps conceal location info. On Saturday, a developer shared a new Google Chrome browser extension called Vital, spelled V-Y-T-A-L, which prevents web pages from honing in on a user's geographic location. While users commonly use a VPN to hide their IP address and physical location, it is possible to use JavaScript functions to query browser info to find a user's general geographic location. Vital spoofs user location and user agent info using a Chrome debugger API, making the spoofing virtually undetectable. Those who wish to try out Vital can install it from the Google Chrome Web Store. All right, so it looks like even with a VPN, tricksters can be tricky and pinpoint your location. So this Vital, uh, extension has been added. I will be adding it to my Chrome right now. This is how easy it is to use. <laughs> and there we go. So now I've got it. Um, yep. Let me, let me do this. Doink. And you probably can't see it because of the pop-up, but oh, this is kind of cool. Nice. Okay. So it looks like you can actually configure it to look like it's coming from anywhere, um, which is nice. So I, I, I now look like I'm coming from Berlin. <laughs> so that's that's pretty that's pretty good. I know the audio is kind of bad. Uh, you could use a VPN and use this Chrome extension at the same time. I think the problem is like the not the problem, but like the the extension is basically just going to make it. The extension is going to be tricky with the um, with the JavaScript happening on on querying your your web browser session, right? So. It, it might be a combination of user agent strings and some other nuanced, but at the, this is at the application level, right? So guys, for a second, just think about the OSI stack. So the VPN kind of protects you and keeps your stuff anonymous at the network layer, layer three, I think, right? So at that layer, you're protected from the VPN. So it looks like you're coming from whatever, London. But at the agent level, excuse me, at the application level, right? So five, six, seven level, that is obviously there's a there's a, a vulnerability with it where you can use JavaScript to uh, pull that stuff. So basically, this Chrome extension is helping protect and subvert whatever kind of uh, vulnerability there was at layers five, six, and seven to protect your identity. So you would want to use these in combination with each other. Uh, obviously, this is a Chrome extension, so it's only going to work on Chrome. 
um, if that's your bag. It'd be curious to see if this is also available on the Brave browser, since Brave is a really popular privacy browsing uh, tool. It may it may be um, that that it's a it's a non factor, but that that's the case with using both of these. So maybe consider using those if you're a Chrome user. I will be using it. If you want to enter the raffle for the coffee, type in the word spicy in chat. S P I C Y. I see Jim Lund on the West Coast. Drop it in here. Nice job, Jim. Let's change our audio again. Do gamers make good soldiers? In May, the U.S. military live-streamed a virtual battle between the Air Force and Army who competed against one another in the popular first-person shooter video game Halo Infinite. Over a half million people logged into Twitch to watch the Air Force win the military's first inter-service gaming championship. While Pentagon officials have become more accepting of gaming, critics contend that the military should not use video game platforms for its recruiting efforts. Some military officials assert that recruiting from the gaming community weakens prospective recruit pool. However, Ray Perez, a program officer at the Office of Naval Research's Warfighter Performance Department, pointed out that, quote, people who play video games are quicker at processing information, end quote. And that does it for today. All right. Change the audio again. I will get this audio sorted out by tomorrow. Get, get down, get down, dog. Um, okay, so this story basically the Air Force held a first person shooter contest. They used hi Halo. Um, I might lose some people in chat right now because of this. I, I don't like Halo. <laughs> in, the, in the grand scheme of things, I'm not a Halo player. I've played it, I don't like the controls. I think it's not a great game. Um, I'm going to, I'm going to die on that hill. Now, the important story here is that, um, the DOD is leveraging, um, video games, FPSs in order to, um, probably it's almost like a PR thing, right. To, um, connect with the youth of today, um, kind of make that mapping between video games, FPS, and actually service. I don't know what the numbers are for, um, um, recruitment into the mil U S military right now, but I do. I do appreciate that they're doing this. Plus, I think it it really it really speaks to how the especially the DOD is, is making an effort to adapt, be less rigid, be less starchy, and kind of connect with um, the the talent pool of youth today. So, like hack a sat, hack the Pentagon, um, you know, this FPS type thing. Um, it, it, it's cool. Right. I'm not saying that they're trying to like connect via video games just so they can buddy up with an 18 year old and then recruit them. But I know there's a lot of people in chat right now who have served in the military. There are great things about it. Okay. So it's not, it's not terrible. I am curious if there was any academic research, like actually controlled um, research to see if FPS gamers made better soldiers. You could, you could see that there is, is some, like there's some anecdotal evidence that would support it. Cause they understand, you know, like what the, the process is of soldiering and you know, all, all that stuff. So it, it is interesting. Okay. Let's get into the, let's get into the raffle. Okay, guys. I know you guys want to do the raffle. If you haven't done it yet, spicy is the keyword. We're going to raffle off a pound of coffee, all the coffees, have a um, a fun name like Hacker Man or Red Alert or something like that. Uh, like a, there's like a sock analyst coffee brand. I mean uh, Bean. So let's check it out. All right, I'm gonna I'm gonna draw right now. I'm being told by my mods that I should not show my chatbot on stream, but I'm going to so everybody can see that I'm not bullshit and uh, choosing an actual winner. So the winner of this. Um, Coffee, ready? Here we go. Good luck to everybody. We'll be doing this the same tomorrow. Here we go. John Samuel Y subbed on June 12th, which is yesterday. So Samuel, welcome to Simply Cyber and nailed it on the first uh, first day. So John Samuel Y. If you are John Samuel Y, I need you to jump on the Simply Cyber Discord. Mods, can you do exclamation point Discord? John Samuel, join Join the Discord and connect with Paul Cummings in Discord. You can 
you can P, uh, DM me in Discord and I'll give you his, his name and stuff. Um, and hopefully I will be able to um, get my audio sorted out tomorrow and my video and stuff like that. Okay. Congratulations to John. Real quick, guys, I want to share a couple things with you. Um, oh, <laughs> you guys won't be able to hear it, but I had sound effects ready um, just in case, right? Like so janky. Here, let me. Let me just do it really quick um, because I, I took the time to set it up, right? Here we go. For all those who are in uh, the squad, new members. Wow. All right. <laughs> Thank you so much. The squad, love having you here. Guys, if you want, I want to remind everybody that this Wednesday at 11.30 a.m. Eastern Standard Time, I will be going heads up against Eric Taylor in the Threat Gen Red versus Blue Cybersecurity Simulator. So if you want to see me eviscerate Eric Taylor of Barricade Cyber Solutions, um, come join. This will be a major event. So it will be an esports broadcast event. So it will have on the Threat Gen channel, uh, Simon Lindstedt and Clint Dungeon will be broadcasting, providing expert commentary and analysis of both Eric's feed and my feed. You can come to Simply Cyber and watch my feed. I will be the red team attacking the facility. I've already got my methodology planned out, my strategy for attack. I'm going to execute the cyber kill chain. I'm not going to say any more than that because I don't want Eric to know, and I know he's in chat. And Eric will be the blue team defending as best he can from the onslaught that is the tidal wave that I will be bringing uh, with my laser eyes. So if you want to come hang out, uh, learn some cybersecurity stuff. Have a great time. 11.30 a.m. The event will probably be about an hour long, just so you can kind of plan for it. Maybe take an early lunch that day. Um, belly up to the to the keyboard and hang out with us. I will be playing music. I will be chill. And uh, I'll be going for the throat on Eric. So that, that'll be a good time. All right, guys. That's going to do it for this this episode uh of the daily cyber threat brief i really genuinely appreciate all of you thank you so much for sticking with us um as we are kind of adapting to the new studio and getting this sorted out uh, i've actually ordered a new light uh to kind of fix the background i'll get my audio set up after this with one of the mods josh mason's actually reached out to me and we're going to get this uh audio sorted out so i don't have to jump around like a like a silly clown you guys have a great day. It was June 13th, Monday. Let's attack the week and I'll see you tomorrow morning at 8 a.m. Have a great one, everybody. Thanks so much.